Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders. This is episode 31 of the Introducing series, and today we're going to be discussing the Nuevo Leon King Snake, uh, which is Lampropeltis leonis. Other common names that you may know it as will be the um, Thayer's King Snake or the Variable King Snake, which is a pretty apt name to be honest. Um, they previously were associated with the Mexicana complex, which kind of harks back to a previous taxonomic state where they were grouped in with some other snakes, which we'll discuss shortly. Um, in many texts, you will still see them listed as Lampropeltis Mexicana theri, which, to be honest, I still, in my mind, I still call them that anyway. Um, they make up part of, with that, with that Mexicana complex and the Pyramelana complex, what is generally group referred to as the tricolor kings, which are um, extreme south USA and Mexico species of snake that are absolutely phenomenal and should be on every beginner's beginner keeper's uh, bucket list of species that they'd like to try and keep because they are ace. They're so tame and easy to keep and just fabulous, fabulous snakes. So, the taxonomic history is confusing, to say the least, uh, and has been a bone of contention amongst scientific paper writers for years, with some only listing two species, and then other authors recognising up to six of them within the Mexicana complex as we know it. So, I found a paper by Hansen and Salmon printed in 2017, which seems about as up to date as I'm going to get, and that recognised six different species. I'll just work off this list. Lampropeltis alterna, the grey banded king snake, first described by Brown in 1902. That's the most northern of this group, occurring in extreme southern Arizona and then down into northern parts uh, of Mexico. Then Lampropeltis greeri, or as we know it, the Durango king snake, first described by Webb in 1961. That comes from Aguas Calientes, uh, Jalisco, and Nayarit states of Mexico. Then there's Lampropeltis leonis, this one, which is the Nuevo Leon king snake, first described by Gunther in 1893, and that comes from Cahula and Tamalipas. You're going to have to forgive me because I don't know how to pronounce some of these. Um, then there's Lampropeltis mexicana, which is the San Luis Potosi king snake, first described by Garmin in 1884. Again, from Aguas Calientes, same as the Greeri, from Guanajuato and Hidalgo states as well. Uh, there's also Lampropeltis ruvenae, which is the Queretero king snake, which was very sought after, actually quite protected in its natural state now. First described by Blanchard in 1920, which also as Queretero occurs in Hidalgo and Jalisco states. There's also one that I've not heard of, which is only known by five species, and only one of those was found to be alive, and that's one called Lampropeltis webi, which was first described by Bryson Dixon and Lascano in 2005, and that occurs in Durango and Sinaloa states, respectively. The taxonomic history and the reviews and changes that this snake has undergone of its own are as follows. Lampropeltis... Oh, it's, yes... Idiot, start again. I'm rushing, you see. So the taxonomic history is uh, first described by Gunther in 1893 as Coronella leonis. Then subsequent changes were to Lampropeltis leonis by Blanchard in 1920, Lampropeltis theori by Loveridge in 1924, Lampropeltis mexicana theori, the first time we see the mexicana complex come to the fore, by Gelbach and Baker in 1962, then Lampropeltis mexicana by Garster in 1982, and then Lampropeltis mexicana theori by Liner and Casas Andrew in 2008, but then remarks made that this was an unnecessary amendment. So, to then further complicate things, I, as well as looking at um, the current classifications on Wikipedia, I looked at the ICUN red list to see if there was any clarity there. Oh, how disappointed I was. So, the ICUN red list just lists Mexicana, which includes Greeri and Leonis, 
although Webe has its own listing and so does Ruth and I. So the ICUN simply recognised San Luis Potosi Kingsnake and group everything in together. So let's say the confusion is bound to continue. So Lampropeltis leonis, the Nuevo Leon Kingsnake, is associated with the Sierra Madre Oriental range on the eastern side of central Mexico. Conversely, the species that it is most commonly mixed in with, and this species is rarely recognised as a full subspecies, the Durango king snake, which is Lamparaltis greeri, is associated with the Sierra Madre Occidental, which is on the western side of Mexico. The two are separated roughly as the crow flies by three to four hundred kilometres of Chihuahuan desert. Yet, for some reason, people think that a greer eye is just a, a, a leonis, which in my mind is not at all. So anyway, leonis occurs on the Ori oriental or eastern Sierra Madre um, and occurs in desert side scrubland. And then this climbs up through uh, thorn scrub and pine and oak woodland over rocky slopes has mixed elevations naturally occurring between 1,000 and 2,200 metres in elevation. And this obviously then leads to us thinking about potentially harsh environments. And this is where we start to think about microhabitat and the way the animals are. At 2,000 metres above sea level, they're going to be very, very exposed. Expect very cold evenings, very cold winters. Adult size for the species is going to be around a metre in length. And mature uh, prey is a large mouse. We're never going to need to feed it anything larger than that, to be honest. You might even be lucky to get it onto a large mouse. Expect your males to fast when they start to get towards sexual maturity and for long-term health and making sure that they maintain good condition, a deep winter brumation would be recommended. And, you know, a lot of times, I remember speaking to a, a woman called Linda Bird, who was a Kaluba breed, breeder back in the 80s and 90s, and I went to see her and she would let her room get fall as low as sort of four or five degrees Celsius for some of these Mexican guys. And it was these that the problem, not the corn snakes she was breeding at the time, trying to get these to lock and breed. We've moved on a lot since then and there's a lot of generations subsequently been bred. But don't be fooled, that 2,000 metre elevation up a mountain uh, in Mexico will provide some really quite challenging um, localised weather and seasonal changes for these snakes to have to cope with. Um, temperament is usually superb. If anything slightly skittish as a baby, but this will completely leave them as an adult and make them completely placid, easy to work with and totally tame. Coupled with the fact that they're only going to be a metre long, this makes a fantastic option as a beginner species. Um, to be honest, you could, you could do far worse than buy um, a uh, Nuevo Leon King. Vivarium size, two and a half to three feet will be plenty it's going to be the length of the snake anyway around three three and a half feet long um, plenty of hiding opportunities a basking spot of around 29 to 30 degrees celsius and the opportunity to move away uh, a rudimentary kit could involve a heat pad if you wanted it to but we'd always prefer to have them on a spotlight on a day night cycling dimmer stack uh, potentially using a ceramic bulb as the most preferable heat source um, substrate would be dry and shifting so beach lignocell or a soil sand mix if you're wanting to go for bioactive or some sort of enriched environment um, there are different phases available this is what we would call a leone's phase but there's also milk snake phase which is a true tricolor that is a mimic of the coral snakes that live within the region and then there's also color bred lineages as well and in the shop we've had sort of these extreme oranges and peaches and all sorts of wonderful wonderful colors the more breeders are working with them the more they're developing some absolutely fabulous looking snakes that really really pop with color and it's really hard to uh, oversell just how pretty these little snakes are they are absolutely fabulous and they're the sort of snakes that realistically we should be looking to work with in far greater numbers Hi. because you know, we're, we're losing out on the diversity side sometimes in this hobby. And it's worth us remembering that some of these old school snakes that 25 years ago, you know, as a, as, as a young kid, I'd never seen these. And I was like, oh, my God, when I saw my first one, they're just oh, so pretty. 
and you know it, they, they were really sought after these were the peak you know everybody was trying to work with them you know the big boa and python breeders nowadays you know they had their own companies breeding rare tricolors and, and that that was their thing and you know these have had their day and it's such a shame that the focus has shifted from them because they're such a rewarding species to keep to be honest any of the complex are but i'm determined that as uh, we get the rest of the species through and me and paul source the rest of the the species of the mexicana complex we'll do a separate gray banded video we'll do a separate durango video and a Queretaro video should the opportunity arise. We want to try and make sure that these videos are useful. We don't want to dumb down. We want to make sure that we're giving you useful information um, and also some of the back history with regards to these challenges. Do they exist? Don't they exist? Are they a subspecies? Aren't they? You know, are, are, are Greer Eye this, that, the other? You know, the paper that I read, which I would recommend, which you can find as an active link on the Wikipedia page, um, was. A really really eye-opening read and when you start seeing just the distances and amount of states that separate these uh, different species actually they don't they, they're called allopatric they don't overlap um, and I think the closest they come is about 25 kilometers of really unsuitable terrain between a couple of the species but the two species that are most commonly confused or there's arguments about like I said, are, are three to four hundred kilometers apart, separated by a desert floor. So, you know, I think definitely there will be more work to be done. Watch this space always with the taxonomic changes. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, me and Paul are committed to providing high quality information. Um, we'll keep the videos coming. We've got a lot more species planned, um, and we really want to develop the channel. Uh, Paul has been concerned about maybe me trying to rush to get through the species so we'll try and just do one a week but we'll make sure that the information we provide is super accurate and maybe a bit more uh, involved so that you're getting your uh, your your week's worth of waiting we'll see you all again soon all the best guys from paul and chaz at snakes and adders peace